Bonjour. Moi, je suis très contente de vous dire hello and welcome. Mon, mon anglais est toujours très mieux que mon français, mais ça va changer. Um, hello. I'm very happy to, to be able to welcome you. I'm um, Bettina Stanzig, the new director of this museum. And um, yes, we have this fantastic show by Zoe Leonard, and that's why we have this symposium today. I looked at the at the um, at the whole um, program, and it's super super interesting. So you are facing a very exciting day today. So um, I have some notes for the introduction. Together with our partners of the UNIGEA Center for Border Studies, we are delighted to all welcome you at the MUDAM for the symposium Rivering Borders, organized within the framework of Zoe Leonard's exhibition Al Rio to the River. So you can see this exhibition until June 6th. Um, and Zoe Leonard's show is the result of five years of work along the Rio Grande. And as you see in the show, you can go along the Rio Grande or Rio Bravo um, while walking throughout um, this exhibition. From 2016 to 2021, Leonard photographed along the 2,000 kilometers where the river is used to demarcate the international boundary between the United States and Mexico, from the border cities of Ciudad Juarez and El Paso to the Gulf of Mexico. The resulting artwork, which is composed of more than 500 photographs, highlights the multiple facets and the often contradictory influences that define today this border river. The river as a natural environment, the river as a built environment, the river as a political feature, but also the river as a place that is surrounded by life, a line of water that is at the heart of a borderland that is particularly rich in terms of cultures, cross influences and languages. Al Rio to the River is also more generally a work about the role that borders play in our daily lives and the way borders determine who we are as society. The exhibition is accompanied by an equally ambitious publication in two volumes, edited by Tim Johnson and published in collaboration with Hatsikans. One volume gathers the photographs of Zoe Leonard, and it's like walking throughout the exhibition, you walk through the book. The other one is composed of an impressive collection of essays, interviews, and poems. Some of the writers are here today. And um, is also writing about um, the Rio Grande and its multiple facets, because it's such an impressive, also metaphor for a lot that is going on in society at the moment. So um, three of them are actually here, to be precise. Thank you, CJ Alvarez. Thank you, Catherine Fraserius, and thank you, Elizabeth Elizabeth Libovici, <laughs> to be precise, for your wonderful contributions to this book. And um, I think it's also the um, source of inspiration for the development of this symposium. During the course of the preparation of the exhibition and the publication, the idea of organizing a symposium emerged, and it was reinforced by the possibility mm -hmm. to collaborate with three amazing partners located in the greater region around Luxembourg, mm -hmm. which are part of the network of the UNIGR, I'm saying it wrongly, I know that, uh, UNIG <laughs> Center for Border Studies, I think. Mm -hmm. It's the Department of Geography and Spatial Planning at the University of Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. It's the North American Literary and Cultural Studies at the Universitat Universität des Saarlandes. The Trier Center for American Studies at the Universitat Trier. We would like to express our warmest thanks to the institutions for the collaboration and um, also to persons who have helped us to conceive and organize the symposium. 
It's Dr. Christian Wille, Senior Researcher in Cultural Border Studies at the University of Luxembourg, mm -hmm. Professor Dr. Astrid Fellner, Chair of North American Literatures and Cultures at the Universität des Saarlandes, mm -hmm. Professor Dr. Nele Savalic, Assistant Professor of American Literature mm -hmm. at Trier Center for American Studies, Professor Dr. Gerd Hurm, Professor of American Literature and Culture in the Department of English Studies at the Universität of Trier. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he can't come with us, but he sends his best wishes. River in Borders is the result of a collaboration between this dream team of scholars specialized in the fields of border studies and American culture mm -hmm. and the educational and curatorial services of MUDAM. The variety of the panel of speakers that we will hear today testify of the richness of their conversation. We would like to thank the seven speakers for accepting our invitation and for being with us today. Thank you, Rebecca Canesu, mm. Dr. Ivor Duncan, CJ Alvarez, Elisabeth Lebowitzki and Katrin Fasserias, Dr. Daniela Johannes. Um, Daniela Johannes can't be with us with us um, because of COVID, but she will give her lecture via Zoom. Good that this is possible today. Mm. And Professor Dr. Astrid Fellner. Three online lectures were also organized by the three universities in the weeks preceding the symposium. Mm. Thank you also to Fabio Santos, Ana Elisa Gomez Laris, and Carlos Morton for their lectures. At MUDAM, I would also like to especially thank um, Chloe Rajanoa, Rajawana mm -hmm. from the Public Department who has coordinated the organization of the symposium. Some of you have visited Zoe Leonard's exhibition in the last month or maybe even this morning mm -hmm. before the start of the symposium. It will be also possible to see this exhibition to the lunch break, so we have also two mediators. You are invited uh, to come with us on a tour and to get more and maybe deeper insight besides the symposium, so please don't miss it. And in connection to the symposium today, we're also delighted to present in Mudem studio on the upper floor of the museum a project created by a group of students coming from Saarland University and the Petro Moyla Black Sea National University in Ukraine. I have, it's called um, Borderland Stories, and I think especially uh, we should also, when we have a war on European soil, uh, we should also think that we really have to support our friends from Ukraine. This is only also a very small um, part, but we are very happy um, to um, have this here. And um, finally, I wanted to mention the three screenings that MUDAM is organizing in the next days and weeks in connection to Zoe Leonard's exhibition. Um, the screenings will take place on Sundays, May 22nd, May 29th, and June 5th in this very same auditorium here. And we include films by Chantal Ackermann, Maya Darin, and Marta Ferrer. Amongst other, um, you find the program on our website. But now I really spoke a lot. I hope you are having a wonderful day, and I'm giving the floor to Christian Wille. Thank you very much for the first uh, welcome words. I would also like to welcome you to our symposium today. And for me, the, the situation is different. My French is better than uh, English, than my English. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't matter. I prepared um, some um, some welcome, uh, some words of welcome um, in English. And I would like to start uh, my welcome speech with uh, a big thank you, because uh, we. And you already um, talked about it. We, that means uh, my colleague Astrid Fellner from Saarland University, Nele Savalich from uh, Trier University, and I from um, University of, La of Luxembourg. We would like to thank very much to uh, the colleagues from the Mudam uh, Museum, because as the UNIGR Center for Border Studies, we were very happy about your cooperation request last year, you got last year. And I think we worked excellently together 
with the new Dam people over the last month in preparing the today uh, the, the program of the symposium in preparing our guest lecture in the last month and so forth. So many thanks uh, to the equipe of uh, the MUDAM for this uh, very positive experience that I think we would like to continue today uh, together. <coughs> but I would also like to express my thanks to, um, on behalf of the UNIGR Center for Border Studies, to all those who have come to Luxembourg and are with us today. We are spending the day together uh, with our speakers who come from four different countries, with uh, students and colleagues from um, Saarland University, University of Syria, um, University um, of Luxembourg, with some artists, with citizens from the Creta region, and uh, many other attendees, participants, who will still join us. I think uh, we will have uh, a larger audience perhaps in the afternoon. We will see that later. <coughs> I have mentioned the UNIGR Center for Border Studies twice now. Please uh, allow me some words, some um, a few words about uh, the UNIGR Center for Border Studies. It is a network of 30 uh, researchers, 30 researchers or border scholars who work on the borders, who work on borders, and who work at the universities in the cross-border region where we are, in the so-called crater region. You know it, I think. That means that the network includes border researchers from Saarland, from Wine and Palatinate in Germany, from Wallonia in Belgium, from the Grand, Grand Est region in, uh, in France, and from Luxembourg. And I'm sure that uh, it will not surprise you if I tell you that this, this diversity of the different locations of the UNIGR Center for Border Studies reflects also the profile of um, the cross-border research network. We distinguish between territorial border studies, cultural border studies, and linguistic border studies. These are three very important dimensions of the border, but, uh, <coughs> but they are or they can also be entangled. And I think we will see that more in detail um, um, today in our discussion. So, we, heard, we already heard it, borders are again a very important topic in the political agenda. Borders are again in the center of social debate. And the idea, perhaps you remember, <laughs> the idea that we are heading for a borderless world has finally turned out to be an utopia. And I think this is particularly demonstrated by the fact that um, the signs of the border, the border studies, yeah, the, the signs of the border um, are now more than ever popular and especially in demand. And at the same time, in border studies, um, in recent decades, different trends can be observed in the way borders have been discussed, in the way borders have been thought about. First, the border is hardly considered as a static line that lies passively um, on a map. The border is rather understood as a performative thing, a performative thing, thing is very abstract, I know it, a prof performative thing that produces border realities, that makes emerging uh, border realities. And the focus here uh, in border studies is primarily on change. That means on the fact that border realities can be shaped and thus uh, border realities can also be spaces of possibilities. What does it mean, uh, spaces of possibilities? That means possibilities of connection, possibilities of hybridity, possibility of empowerment. <coughs> Another focus, especially in cultural border studies, is on the process of how border realities emerge. That means, how, um, and here, uh, power critical perspectives are taken and questions are asked about who or what is involved in such processes and in what way. <coughs> and what resistances, contestations, negotiation processes, and so on, uh, will take place. More to make it short, it is um, about critical and complex zooming on bordering processes, on borderizations, 
or as one says in French, on <coughs> processus de frontierisation. <coughs> Another trend that is increasingly found in humanities but has only recently been received in border studies is the so-called more than human perspective. This perspective inscribes, inscribes to what is also called uh, posthumanism. You know it, I think. And here, in addition to people or institution, institutional actors, materialities are included in approaches to bordering processes. Materialities are then understood as active parts, in, and I think that's important, as active parts in the co-construction of border realities and materialities as a term, as a category, and uh, encloses um, very different things. If you have a look in literature, in research, you can discover very different things that can range from trees, from walls, animals, viruses, um, artifacts uh, in general, but also sounds and liquids. And it is exactly such a more than human perspective on borders that we will discuss today. Because today we take a closer look um, at the nexus of territory, power, and water using the example of rivers, or in other words, using the example of riverine borders with uh, its materialities, with its social logics behind instrumentalizations, identity politics, and so forth. And to do this, we invited seven speakers, seven colleagues who already have analyzed and reflected about such riverine borders, and I think. Um, <coughs> not I think, I'm sure that these analyses and reflections uh, were in very different disciplinary perspectives. And I'm very much looking forward to your talks and to the discussion. This morning uh, we will get some insights into border realities on the Mosul River, the Evros River, on the Rio Grande, and I think or I hope that we will get more or become more familiar with the idea how rivers can be accomplices of the border. And this afternoon, in these uh, talks, we will learn more about the dynamics, about the fluidity of borders. It will be about hybrid identities, and that is borderlands in a, in a metaphorical sense, and their productive potentials. Thank you, in any case, um, to our guests for being with us today. Thank you to our guests for sharing your research, for sharing your, your ideas, your reflections on borders, and um, your ideas about this, connect, this uh, connection between rivers, water, and um, borders. But we have, um, we already talked about uh, one uh, project, the project uh, Borderland Stories, and my colleague Astrid Kölner would like to say a few words about that. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour. Bienvenidos. Welcome. It is a great pleasure for me uh, to be here this morning. Thank you. Uh, I can only agree, you know, with my colleague um, Christian Wille, um, because we've been very much looking forward to this event, me and my students who are also here. And also a big uh, hello and welcome to everyone who is joining us uh, at home, because I believe we're also uh, live streaming this event. Now, this has been a very, or is a very special uh, occasion uh, for me in several ways, uh, and much already has been said, but uh, let me just, you know, explain this from my perspective. I'm an Americanist, and so for me, as an Americanist who has lived in the greater region now for almost, well, actually more than 12 years, I'm always very thrilled, and it's actually quite rare here, you know, to have an exhibition by an American artist. Um, and so when I uh, heard that Mudam was organizing this uh, great exhibition on the work of uh, Zoe Leonard. I was just, you know, wow, you know, it's like this is this is just uh, great. So thank you very much, and um, I hope that you all get a chance to 
see um, uh, the exhibition, which is um, upstairs. And then, of course, I'm very happy to be able to collaborate with my uh, new colleague, uh, Professor Savalis at uh, Trier University. And uh, this is also a wonderful um, occasion, my partner in crime, as I refer to Christian Wille, you know, to bring our students together and, um, and uh, organize this uh, study day today. Well, and since the, uh, if you look at the exhibition, since El, El Rio, the river, is so prominent, obviously so, right, in uh, Zoe's uh, um, <coughs> photograph, it was, of course, pretty clear to us that the topic of this study day, of this small workshop, would actually, you know, be on the topic of the river. So um, we focus, as my uh, colleague has just pointed out, on, on uh, riverine borders here, on border materialities, um, and we will see that, uh, you know, we will pick up the river as a key uh, a trope, you could say, um, in all of our uh, different presentations. Now, when I came uh, here to Mudam on February the 25th, I believe it was, for the opening um, of uh, this uh, exhibition, um, <coughs> it was actually the day after the 24th of February, right, when the world uh, 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 was, you know, changed and uh, we were all um, paralyzed by what had happened uh, that uh, morning. Um, at the time, you know, I had been involved in researching and uh, teaching and a teaching collaboration really with several colleagues at Petromohyla Slaksi National University in Nikolaev in Ukraine. And I've been doing this since 2014, um, really. And it was just until the beginning of February this year that we were involved in uh, the compilation of a multimedia student project uh, together with my colleagues. Um, and we were just about to finish this project. And our students, uh, this is a team teaching project. Our students were involved, um, collaborated uh, with each other, and compiled uh, long reads, so-called long reads in the form of uh, a landing page with short uh, film uh, clips. And this was a project that was conducted online, this you know, team teaching project, and was made possible by the EVZ Foundation, which is a foundation in Germany that uh, fosters uh, co um, a collaboration between uh, Ukraine and Germany, particularly when it comes to uh, the younger generation. So it's a youth dialogue um, program. And I really want to thank the Mudam. You know, it was right there on the 25th when we talked about it that you have offered, you know, for us to also be able to present the results of these projects. And I want to thank, you know, Mudam, you know, one more time, but also our students who are here, um, not all of them, but, you know, um, some of them. And please take uh, a moment then during lunch break, uh, go up to the first floor, look at the exhibition, and then it's right there. Uh, in the Muram studio and uh, talk to uh, the students who are here. And because of this uh, situation now, uh, we actually have also the great honor of being able to have uh, two of our Ukrainian students here as well. So at this point, I would also like to welcome uh, my Ukrainian colleagues who are here. And I would like to uh, thank also my colleague, Professor Promkevich, who was the initiator or whose brainchild uh, this multimedia project was, and uh, I was just on the phone with him, and he might be available via Zoom and also upstairs in, in the uh, Mudan studio if you also want to uh, talk to him. Um, so I really want to, uh, uh, again, you know, thank everyone who was involved. Alina, with whom I, uh, Dr. Mozalewska, with whom I co-taught uh, this class, is also here. So take a chance and just uh, ask us questions and, and take a look. Um, at these uh, projects. Okay, so now we've already talked a lot, uh, and I think it's high time now to get to our first presentation. So we do three presentations now in the morning and then three presentations after lunch. And it is actually my great honor, oh, here she is, I was looking for our first speaker to present our first speaker to you this morning. And um, this is uh, Rebecca Kanishu from uh, Trier University. 
And while you're getting ready, I um, will uh, read uh, your bio so that uh, we know, you know, where your background um, uh, is. So he's a PhD candidate uh, currently in human geography at the Department of Spatial and Environmental Sciences at Trier University. But she has a background uh, in uh, social and cultural anthropology, and she is interested in topics that encompass human environment relations, political ecology, and more than human geographies in connection to border studies. Uh, we've been working together for several years now within our UNHCR Center for Border Studies. Uh, we've also co-authored a couple of uh, articles in our border glossary. And I knew that you were working on the river, so I was like, Rebecca was the first name that came to our mind, one of the local experts here who has worked um, on the river, and that is because her PhD project is actually entitled Liquid Lines on Rivers and Borders in the Anthropocene. And in, in this uh, study, she studies the relation between people, fish, and transboundary, the Moselle River, <coughs> as infrastructure from a political, ecological perspective. And I believe that your, <coughs> excuse me, your talk uh, today We'll focus precisely on that. So please join me in welcoming Rebecca and your title is Liquid Lines and Exploration of Hydro-Social Borders. The floor is yours. Yeah, hello, Moyenne, bonjour, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here and very thankful for the invitation. Also, to see everybody in person. You haven't seen each other for a long time, so um, I'm happy to see you again and to meet all of you in person uh, throughout the day. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about hydrosocial borders and does it work? Yeah. Um, so I want to begin um, to with an introduction of the concept of hydrosociality, and then I'm thank you. <laughs> um, then we're going to um, understand, trying to understand this idea of hydrosociality by looking at the Moselle River, which is the case study and the site of my geographical research. And um, I think you all have probably a connection to the Moselle, so um, later we can discuss about your experiences. Um, we're going to look at the river um, as a state border. We're going to see how the river is also a connection across borders. And we're going to learn about the river as a bordered ecosystem. So first, I want to start with this picture, um, which you have probably seen the last time in school or so, in biology class. <laughs> so this um, picture shows the hydrological cycle, um, the cycle that water, the physical cycle that water does around the world. So from the oceans, the water evaporates, condensates, into clouds and then rains down or snows down back to the earth, builds glaciers, feeds uh, our rivers, feeds our groundwater bodies that flow back into the ocean. But if we want to understand the connectedness of social and natural or material systems, like we do when we talk about riverine borders, um, we need to take a closer look in how these hydrological cycles actually connected to our human activities. And for this, um, I want to introduce you to the concept of hydrosociality, which was developed by two geographers, uh, Jamie Linton and Jessica Butts. And they have this yeah, picture, which is not so beautiful, but <laughs> like a, a functional <laughs> explanation of the hydrosocial cycle. Um, 
where we can see how that water is not only this materiality, so it's not only H2O, but it's how we use water as a resource, and this is negotiated in, yeah, in powerful conflicts sometimes, um, concerns how we distribute water, how we, um, how we use it, and which kind of technologies and infrastructures we build to use water. And this also then influences the, high, uh, the materiality of water, so we see them in their interconnectedness. And uh, Linton and Butts um, described the hydrosocial cycle as not concerned with water per se, but with these hydrosocial relations. And the social natural processes by which water and society make and remake each other over space and time. And this is exactly what we're um, going to uh, explore when we're looking at the uh, Moselle River. And um, we're going to see how the state, different political actors, um, different economic actors influence the river and the river transform the river and how this is also connected to border making in the greater region. So um, to, to understand this, we're going now to the Moselle River and I'm using here different maps. So I'm taking like a geographical approach and we're going to look at these maps to see the river from different perspectives and we're going to hear different statements um, from people I have interviewed in my research, but also um, yeah, from um, historical events. Yeah. So um, we're going to start with this picture that shows um, the Moselle's position in Europe, and it's just a very classical map that um, shows the bordering countries and um, where the river is, is flowing. So the Moselle is a 544 kilometer long, partially dammed transboundary river. The source is in the Rock Mountains in France and it merges with the Rhine River in Koblenz. It was canalized uh, in the 1960s for shipping and is until now one of the most important rivers for this greater region. Um, before the 1950s, the Moselle was a free-flowing river with moving sediment and um, very rich um, biodiversity. But after the Second World War, um, you know that there were like economic interests, countries wanted to rebuild their economies, and especially France pushed for a regulation and canalization of the river because they had economic interest. They wanted to make the river navigable for ships that could carry up to 1,500 tons of goods. And this was because in the northern part of France, in Lorraine, there was the steel industry. And they were very interested in getting the river canalized so with this, they could ha have easier access to the Rhine River and with that access to the main Atlantic seaport to Rotterdam, which meant easier and cheaper access to the world market for the steel products. And then on the German side, there was a lot of um, yeah, controversies about that. There was suspicion, there was still these post-war tensions, and especially in the rural area where there was a, also a strong uh, emerging coal and steel industry. Um, they were very much against this project. There were really hard fights and resistance and uh, they still talked about like being enemies and um, it was a very difficult situation. But then uh, in the 1950s, the reason why the river in the end was canalized um, had to do with another border conflict that was still um, yeah, lying there after the war. So the La region at that point still belonged to France and was especially under economic control of France. And they had a referendum. They were asked if they were still want to belong to France or not. And they over 60% voted with no, 
which was interpre interpreted by the German side as they want to belong to Germany. So um, it was this still, yeah, unresolved border conflict that created the decision to make this deal. So Konrad Adenauer, uh, Chancellor, German Chancellor at that time, um, decided with a lot of politicians and economic actors against him that the Moselle should be canalized as a deal, um, as a territorial deal to reintegrate the Saar region back to Germany. So the treaty was signed um, on the same day for the canalization of the Moselle River and the reintegration of the Saar um, land to Germany or Western Germany at that time. So in this map, you see the, um, the red part of the Moselle. It is the part that was then canalized. And it was a very fast or regulation of the river that only took eight years from 56 to 64. And it included the construction of fortune sluices and hydropower plants and dams that changed the whole hydromorphology of the river. So it, it, it changed um, everything that, we, like our romantic image that we maybe have of free flowing rivers. No, now. It's more like um, a lot of lakes with slowly flowing water that are like, like a chain after each other. And with this material transformation of the river, there came also a discursive and political transformation of the cross-border relations between the countries. And this was especially present during the inauguration of the um, infrastructure river, which you can see here. So um, the uh, presidents of Luxembourg um, and um, France and Germany, they took this cruise to inaugurate the river from uh, France, from Attach to Trier. And just uh, as an example, to show you how um, it changed uh, this talk from enemies to friends, as um, an excerpt of, of the speech of Charles de Gaulle that he did after this inauguration. He said, now, on the banks of this river, the trust and friendship to which the people of France, Germany, and Luxembourg have henceforth joined end so many perils, so much dragging, so much pain, of which this river has been for centuries the vain cause and the sad witness. So we can see that in this case, society and water, and more specifically, borders and rivers are interconnected and make each other. And now, like from this historical transformation of the river, I want to bring you to the actual border between Germany uh, and Luxembourg. Um, so I just took this um, map of Google Maps that's probably very familiar to all of you. And uh, we see the Moselle and the border depicted like as a straight line cutting through the water. And on the other, uh, in the other picture, we see a little boy and you cannot, you cannot see it, but there's a tiny, tiny European flag on top of it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, and this point marks the spot where these three borders the border triangle is. And I learned about it when I visited the Schengen Museum and uh, talked with the director um, about, about the treaty and what this meant for the area. And then she pointed uh, me to this boy and she said, um, we have marked the point on the Moselle with this boy where the three countries actually meet. And we really only did that because at some point it was no longer feasible for us to always explain to people, yes, back there, because so many people ask about this point. There's not a day in the tourist information office where people don't ask, where is the point where the three countries meet? So that's always a fascination. But although this, I'm going back here, although this, uh, map shows a straight borderline splitting the river and the boy marks this exact meeting point. It does not depict 
like the real river border. Because the Moselle between Germany and Luxembourg is not a strictly defined borderline because the water body belongs to both countries at the same time. It is a shared territory or liquid territory that is called a condominium where the German border ends on the, on the Luxembourgish border riverbank and the Luxembourgish border ends on the German riverbank. And um, so in this sense, there could have been no better place uh, to sign the Schengen Agreement, which was also signed on a boat <laughs> on the Moselle River, because this is the exact space that defies this kind of exact demarcation. And um, still, there is this interest to fix a border, this interest to find uh, a, a spot um, where we can, you know, pinpoint where we can orient ourselves to. And I think this is interesting um, when we think about rivers as borders that it is really hard um, in this kind of fluid spaces to find um, a fixed, a fixed uh, line that in this case actually even neither materially nor legally exists. <laughs> so when we come now from this river as a state border, um, now we continue to the river as an infrastructure. And um, we can see that in this, when we look at this map, it shows um, the networked system of waterways in Germany that of course cross borders within the country, but also state borders and are connected to a wider network of um, yeah, navigable um, rivers. And this is nothing new. Rivers have always been used as a way to transport things, to cross borders, and to make connections. Um, and this is, that's why I brought you this picture um, of the statue over there. When we stay in this area, we especially know this, that this area was um, conquered by the Romans um, almost 2,000 years ago. And what did they use? They used the rivers to expand the territories, to colonize um, territories, and to build settlements along the rivers. So Trier is the oldest city in Germany that was <laughs> conquered by the Romans. And this um, ship is the famous wine ship of Neumagen. Um, you can see it in the museum in Trier. It dates back to 220 AC. And in archaeology, there's also discussion that this was actually a, a war ship. So the Romans used this to transport their troops to transport supply for warfare, and uh, in peaceful times, they also used it to transport other goods. And the uh, other picture you can see Trier in the 16th century, where you can also see little boats um, transporting goods. So this idea of um, conquest and um, expanding frontiers has also a lot to do with the way we use rivers across borders and to create um, new frontiers. And um, as we have seen, or when we talked about the canalization, so this is still the case. The river is still used as a, a navigation route. And one interesting thing I think I came across was when I talked to the Moselle Commission that is a tree patriate organization that governs the, um, the shipping route. And I talked to the um, secretary and she explained to me that at that point they were working on a new system to make it easier for the skippers to navigate the Moselle. And she said they were working on this IT system that was supposed um, to make the, to help the skippers to not notice when he reports that he has just crossed the border. So even um, 
these technologies are created to synchronize um, yeah, a smooth and borderless migration along the river and even to make people forget that there are actually borders. So they shouldn't even notice when they're following the river. And this is also the case, not only when people uh, drive along the river, but also when they cross from one riverbank to the other. So as an example, I've uh, brought you uh, the twin villages of Wasserbillig in, Ober in uh, Luxembourg and Oberbillig in Germany that you probably all know. And um, when I was there, I could spend a day with the um, ferry captain, Peter, and we would drive uh, on the ferry the whole day. At some point, I completely lost track of like how many times we've crossed because we were like always going back and forth, back and forth. And um, yeah, it was a crazy experience. <laughs> but before I met him, uh, the pandemic started. And that was a really point that influenced uh, this area a lot because the villages, they have this, I mean, the ferry connection can be traced back to the 15th century. So there has always been this connection between the two villages. Also, there, there were shifting territorial belongings in history. Sometimes they belonged to the same territory, then they were separated again, but they had always this connection across the water. And um, when the pandemic hit, as you, I mean, everybody knows it here, that the borders were closed from Germany to Luxembourg, which also meant that the ferry connection was shut down for two months, which really um, changed like everyday routines of the people because the next bridges where you can cross the river are about 10 kilometers away. And when I met uh, the Peter, the ferry captain, I was talking to him about, about the time and about his job and his experience. And I asked him, do you perceive the river as a border or not? And he said, no, why? It's all open. And I asked, because you are the connection, so to speak? And he said, yes, it's all open. I don't see any reference to say it's somehow a border. It's all open. Everything is open and it's also nice that way. And I asked him, could you have imagined that it would become a border again as it was now due to COVID? And he said, I think that after the Schengen de decision, nobody, nobody thought it would be possible. So these closed borders seems like an impossibility for those leading trans-border and cross-river lives. But the pandemic has shown how fragile these border textures are and how contingent these practices of bordering are and that openings and closings um, can come very quickly and can have different impacts for different people at different times. So it's not um, as static as, as we might think it is when we just look at the map. So now I want to take you after these reflections of the river state border and infrastructure and uh, how we cross it or use it to cross borders. I want to come to the materiality of the river itself. So this map shows the catchment area of the Moselle River which means all the small little rivers and water bodies that are connected to it and that flow into the river, so that feed the Moselle with the water. And we see how in this picture, the actual state borders, they vanish. So, and even you can also see that it expands much into Belgium. <laughs> So the water creates its own kind of territoriality, so hydrological territory and its own spatiality. And um, this also has to do with the agency of water, so because it, it has its own um, ways to flow, its own direction across borders, of course, across human borders. And 
And this affects how we manage um, water bodies. In this picture, you can see um, the nuclear power plant of Katunum, that you <laughs> also know. And um, it lies uh, at the border between uh, and France, but close to the border to Germany and Luxembourg. And it uses the Moselle River water to cool down the reactors. And this water is taken out, so like, like a massive amount of water. And then after being cleaned, it goes back to the river, but it's like it's heated. So the river water is heated and there's also uh, some leftover chemicals. We, con we can't filter out everything. But this, of course, has effects downstream across the border because the water flows in one direction. And this um, leads to the necessity to somehow govern um, these, these flows across the border. And that's why the EU created this uh, Water Framework Directive that um, yeah, regulates the quality, quantity of water. And they asked the countries of transboundary water bodies to come together and to find you know, common solutions for these um, problems. And uh, I, when I interviewed uh, one employee of the um, International Commission for the Protection of the Moselle and the Saar, that are concerned with these water framework directives, um, he said there could also be measures that would perhaps have a positive impact on one side of the border, but that could have a neg negative impact, for example, on a groundwater body that is on the other side of the river. The essential work of our commission is to align and set goals at the borders. So it is especially at the borders where water flows over these political borders, where is the focal point of, um, of the water governance. And this, of course, leads to different problems because of water's materiality and agency um, that leads then to power imbalances because the country that is uh, upstream has always a better standpoint than the countries with the downstream. And then we continue yeah. um, with this last um, picture that is the Moselle River, but we see it now at, in its three dimensionality. And when we see this, we can also see um, uh, the different um, towns where um, there are sluices and barrages and hydropower plants, so where the river is cut like into stairs. And when we look at this picture, we may, we may realize that the rivers are not liquid lines. They are three-dimensional living spaces for also other than human inhabitants. And in my research, I especially focus on fish. And fish, um, on migratory fish, which are also border crossers like par excellence. And I research uh, eel in the Moselle. So uh, in the one picture, we can see the migratory path of the eel. They live in the European freshwater systems and then for reproduction, have to travel all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to the Sargasso Sea. That is where the Bermuda Triangle is. And they reproduce there, and the babies can, uh, swim back to, the, um, to Europe. But because of the um, transformation of rivers with uh, barrages and hydropower plants, there have become critically endangered. So there is a loss of up to 98% of the whole population of eels. And that's why um, I accompany um, um, eels uh, conservation initiative along the Moselle. So this is one of the fishermen I go along with to do eel catching. And uh, <laughs> um, they catch the eel and carry them to the Rhine River 
set them out there so they could swim, in, th in theory, swim to the Atlantic. And the problem is that so the damage potential of these turbines is particularly high for these animals. In some cases, an animal is hit several times by such a blade and injured in different parts of the body, or the body is also just cut through. And because all of them have to reproduce, this is the course, uh, this is of course of enormous importance for the population in the Moselle catchment area. So there's also no way to reproduce eel artificially. Um, there's only this wild species, and um, in their case, the river that has been infrastructured by humans because of economic interests, because of political uh, and border-making reasons, um, the river has become a bordered space for these eel who have to migrate for reproduction. So, and these um, riverine infrastructure borders have become an existential threat to these fish and of course also to other species in this ecosystem. So, we have moved now uh, <laughs> all along the river from the river state border as an infrastructure, as an ecosystem. When we think about um, back to the hydrosocial cycle, um, we have seen how society and political, with political interests and different conflicts come together with this river and its materiality, and we've seen how they make and remake each other over time. Mm, so to sum up, I'd say that hydrosocial borders are ambiguous sites of political negotiation and material transformation. They are always in motion and enable the movement of people, things, and territory. But of course, they can also block this kind of movements. I think as we will see in the next uh, presentation, um, for example, when there's a flood, movement is blocked, but also migration across the river can be very terrifying and difficult and dangerous. And the river, or hydrosocial borders, are also three-dimensional living spaces transcending these human borders. So I think, um, or thinking about these hydrosocial borders, has the potential to challenge and shift our presumptions about liquidity and solidity, about permeability of borders and stability, uh, but also about flux and control of these border spaces and of rivers. Thank you. Do you want to start your discussion a bit? Uh, I have a general question, um, uh, one question that I'm thinking about uh, since a lot of time. This is the fascination of the border. You uh, presented the results with the interview of the director of the Schengen Museum in Schengen, and uh, it's really very interesting because the, the Boji or Boji in English, that they put, it was really because it was demanded by people to have an orientation to materialize the fascination of the border. But I would like to know, perhaps it's, it's an open question to, to the whole audience, what is the fascination of the border? And what uh, the director 
uh, said about uh, what the fascination is or yeah um we were talking about especially about tourists also coming from from other countries and um she told me that there were for example a lot of tourists from asia but also from turkey and they were super fascinated about this space where you can just, where the borders are open, where you can just walk across the bridge and then you're in a different country, and that that is possible without checks, without control. So they were kind of, uh, had the need to bring this together in their brains, but then at the same time wanted to see the spot where the border is because the border was not materially or physically present in any other way because it's an it's like an open space where you can move freely and they couldn't bring it together it's like but there is a border but we cannot see it so they had this need to fix it really um make it visible on the river but this is of course contradictory but because the river there is no spot on the river that is um at least the border between germany and luxembourg because it's the whole water body <laughs> it's shared yeah. Mm -hmm. That means the fascination is the invisibility of the border, but at the same time, there is a need uh, for visibility. So, yeah, yeah. It's a bit crazy. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that I think it's um, it's a lot about orientation. I think it's. Uh, what, what the people are looking for is orientation. They need to know where the border is. And if we hadn't, if we um, didn't have any signs, for example, of now you're in a different country, I think it would be uh, like they would be even more confused, I would say. So um, I, I think this, just to add to what has been said, that orientation is, I think, a very important point, um, uh, which is related to fascination and to like this need of to know where are we and where are where is the space in which we are moving yeah it's also the need to cr to, to create space to you know to to navigate ourselves in this spatial world and um with the other example of the um of the skippers who were um where there were attempts to create a different kind of spatiality spaces without borders just just flows in the in the landscape so it's um it's a because they have a different need for orientation they are moving all the time and that's why they're not supposed to be stopped by any kind of borders so rebecca i'm i'm so impressed with your work and i this is the reason why I love coming to Europe and talking about borders <laughs> with, with, with people over here because I always learn so much. And one of the things that struck me as most kind of mind-boggling to me coming from the United States is that the, the big canalization um, and channelization projects began in the 1950s, whereas by the 1950s in North America, everything had been hammered already for, for, the, for the previous three decades at least. And so we were kind of done destroying our, our and breaking up watersheds in North America, Mexico included. And so could you, could you tell us a little bit more, tell me at least, because I'm so fascinated by this, a little bit more about the broader context of damming large-scale hydrological engineering on, in European watersheds? Yeah, I think, um, or I can, at least I can tell you for this area, <laughs> Um, of course, there have been canalization regulation projects in European and German rivers before the before the 1950s, but especially this area because it is a borderland area. It's a border space. Um, there were so many conflicts about the river. It was just a transboundary uh, river, and um, this area has experienced many wars so this has always been um, uh, I mean it has been discussed to canalize the river since 1800 something something but um, it never happened because 
the parties could not agree where to start the canalization or not, and um, this, this border zone has always been quite tricky in times, in times of war. It was, I mean, there were, um, for the French uh, German war, they, they built um, train tracks along the river to carry troops and supply, but the river has not been touched before, and it was really only after the, um, after the war that France and Germany started to talk again about this project, and it was also um, because there was this um, uh, treaty in Europe, the Steel and Coal Union, that was formed before, before even the um, EU institutions. So that was actually the start of this um, European cooperation, and there was also used as a pressure from France to push for the canalization because they said, we have this um, treaty of uh, steel and coal, and this means that we all should have the same um, mm, starting point, uh, or how do you say, we shouldn't have to compete in that way that we are now competing because we are like one space, um, and we should have the same um, arrangements or conditions for um, pr production and export of these products. And they, they used this European treaty actually as um, of a part to of the neg negotiation to push for the canalization. And, uh, and also the Moselle is a pretty small, it's, it's not that a big river, and um, yeah, other rivers were maybe more important to be canalized before. Maybe to make a little, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a question. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that this idea of canalization in the early 60s had also something to do with the larger map of the nationalization by the Nasser of the Suez Canal, which happened in 1956? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not so far. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's a kind of a, you know, larger consequence of that move, which was an enormous move, um, a decolonizing move, in fact. Rebecca, always amazing to hear you speak. Um, I'm really in interested in this kind of contradiction in terms of the hydrosocial border, because it's kind of like the hydrosocial is kind of as Linton and Buds and others uh, define it as something which is about the co-constitution between communities and the wa water body. And then, so in your research, I'm then thinking about how, when you're interviewing a fisherman from one of the three nation states, how then might a fisherman from the other nation state work into this space? And how do they, you know, I'm just thinking about how do the different countries, do they hydrosocially connect and co-constitute with the water bodies in different ways? Or is there a common kind of connection? I'm thinking about this specifically because the, the water bodies I'm dealing with, it's been centuries since that kind of level of communication across the water has been possible. Right, I was seeing Zoe Leonard's photos of children playing in the Rio Grande. That would be impossible in, in this particular river because of militarization. So it's interesting to then think about in this condition how then not only the fishermen might be engaging, but also just people who are less engaged as then fishing um, might speak to the river and be engaged. Mm -hmm. I think that's very different because the, especially the Moselle is very different in the three countries. So it's, it's not like one river that is always the same. Where the, the source is, the river is in France, the river is not canalized. So um, it's still like a free flowing river. There's also one part that is called Moselle Sauvage. It's like a, a natural protected area with a free flowing sediment and the river branches build and rebuild themselves. Um, but still there's, um, in that part, for example, they, they take out the sediments and the, the sand and, and the stones for construction. And then uh, the French part is very much um, characterized by industry, so there are big uh, companies like soda companies and um, the power nuclear, nuclear power plants, so it's much more industrialized river. And then we come to this part in Luxembourg, in Germany, especially then north of it's like it's characterized by 
a very rural area and with wine cultivation and very steep valleys. And this, of course, uh, like the landscape changes all the time and this affects how people relate to the river and what they do with the river. And uh, when it comes to fishing, so um, actually the Moselle in the German part of the Moselle is um, the last uh, river in Germany that is actually um, fully served by by fishermen, like the, by professional fishermen. So every from from one um, dam to the other, um, it's always like rented by a fisherman, and um, they fish. For example, uh, I think it's roads in English. I don't know. But um, what you eat here in Luxembourg is uh, friture de la Moselle. <laughs> so um, I talked to a fisherman who fish, fishes the fish for friture de la Moselle, which is a kind of national dish in Luxembourg that's fried fish from the river. And, um, yeah, and like as a bordering example, also he fished the fish for a long time. It is his livelihood. He goes out to the river every day. Um, to catch the fish, and this was also interrupted by the pandemic because, of course, not only the borders closed, but everything was shut down, and the restaurants were shut down where he sells his fish. So in Luxembourg, the restaurants all closed, and um, this really interrupted uh, his fishing practices. So, yeah, just as an example. Okay, I think we can take one more question, but then I think we have to slowly move on to the next presentation. And there is one question here in the back, so I'll pass the mic to you, Tobias. Um, thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, and you've touched upon this, um, I think, but since you mentioned that the steel and coal mining industry has been largely made redundant, um, I wonder if there are any measures being taken, perhaps even transnationally, to renaturalize parts of the river. Um, so out of curiosity, could you tell us more about this besides the project that you're working on with EOS? Um, well, there are no attempts to, let's say, deconstruct the barrages and dams and hydropower plants because that would be like a massive transformation and would, would have also very unclear outcomes. But um, so the river was infrastructured, but once you start this process, it's never ending because the river is like the water has certain kind of materiality that of course influences any kind of construction. So there's constant work to repair, to rebuild, to um, transform the river, so infrastructuring is an ongoing, continuous process. It's never finished. And uh, one colleague of mine, uh, she said, like, infrastructure is always broken. So <laughs> there's continuous work. And this also um, includes working on the river in terms of um, in, in ecological terms, because of course, our also our um, relation to the environment has changed since the 50s, and this has also put down in uh, law, especially in European law, with water framework directives, but also other environmental laws. And this means that for every construction that you do in the river, you have to compensate these things ecologically. So um, there are no big transformations, but they are building um, like small islands and build um, areas where the water is more still so fish can breathe there. So th there are a lot of these tr for small transformations or before like 20 years before, they really cut down the vegetation um, on the riverbanks because they wanted it to look neat and clean and nice and people who are living on the river they were complaining about, um, yeah, I want to see the river from my window, so please cut down the trees. <laughs> but of course, this has also changed because um, 
yeah, perception or knowledge about ecosystems has changed and we know that we need the trees and the bushes and the grass to grow because it's, it's this exact living space for aquatic species but also other species along the river. So yeah, there are these like small transformations uh, also happening. All right, well, thank you very much for these wonderful, enlightening <laughs> words. Great, great talk, always a pleasure. I couldn't agree more. Uh, with actually our next speaker, right? Uh, um, that, that this is a wonderful topic. And you will, of course, stay with the topics. So our next speaker uh, is, um, what's your first name? I forget. Ivor. <laughs> Ivor. Duncan, who, uh, if you come up to the floor, I don't know where the camera is, I'll go here right next to you, who is a writer, artist, and interdisciplinary researcher who focuses on the overlaps between political violence and water ecosystems. He is a postdoctoral fellow in environmental humanities um, at the Foscari University in Venice. Ifra holds a PhD from the uh, Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths entitled Hydrology of the Powerless and is developing a book project, Necrohydrology, a concept which exists where the knowledge and corresponding management of water in its multiple forms is produced as adversarial to life and positions, um, and positions human and environmental justice as intrinsically connected. Um, this sounds very complicating to me, yes. but I'm sure that you will explain all of this uh, in a great way. Ifer is also visiting lecture at the Royal College of Art and today he is here, or do you also live in the greater region? Because in Venice. you do live in Venice. Well, it's a suburb to the greater <laughs> region, I think, <laughs> just like Paris is a <laughs> suburb to here. So welcome to the greater region, and we're very much looking forward to your talk on weaponizing the river. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, um, well, it probably will just remain at that level of complexity, I'm afraid, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, uh, just, to, just to start, I um, just wanted to thank every, all the organizers, and uh, it's so wonderful to speak on this incredible panel. Um, this research is also co-produced with my dear friend Stefanos Levides. Um, but I'll start with uh, a little vignette from Fieldwork, which was done in um, February 2020, it is actually the, 2019, which is probably the last time that such field work is possible in the region. It was early evening when we arrived at the migrant cemetery, a fenced area overlooking Sidero, a majority Turkish Muslim village around 20 kilometers from the river on the Greek side of the border. Except for the fencing, there was little on the hillside to suggest that this field was a site of border violence. The cemetery is no longer in use due to claims that unidentified people have been buried here in mass graves. On the day of our visit in February 2020, six empty graves, dug months before in anticipation of people found in the river, were still flooded by winter rainwater. We used a hydrophone to record inside one of these empty graves. The recording is almost silent. The only noise present is the buzz of the game being turned up in the effort to identify any possible signal. Why we made the recording and what it means has been a constant question ever since. These empty graves were dug for a group of people that never came. They speak to death as a constant presence, as something to be anticipated at the border. Our doubts about what um, these recordings mean 
reflects the uncertain knowledges that pervade the river border environment. Perhaps the silence, even gestures towards an entire river ecosystem turned into a weapon. The second longest river in the Balkans, running for most of its 528 kilometers through Bulgaria as the Maritza, before forming the Evros in Greek or Merich in Turkish for its final 218 kilometers. This final stretch is frequently referred to as the land border or natural border between Greece and Turkey. The river has remained the boundary since its delimitation by the 1923 Lisbon Peace Treaty. In recent years, it has become an established route for refugees traveling through Turkey. Following the failed coup in 2016, Turkish asylum seekers are also increasingly crossing the river into the EU. Many who cross, however, are not registered. They are summarily arrested, detained, and violently returned across the river to Turkey through the illegal practice widely referred to as pushback. With this presentation, we will follow the river through the legacies of historic demarcation, the recent use of river islets as what we call islands of hyperlegality, the region's production as an embankment, and finally to the delta itself, where the river meets the Aegean Sea. As hydrologists and other river scientists think of rivers as including their entire catchments and floodplains, we argue, and including um, tributaries and distributaries, we argue that to study a river border also requires thinking through its entire hydrology. Here, defensive architectures extend beyond built and engineered interventions to include the processes that take place within the river, as well as the fields and atmospheres of the border. Indeed, it is clear to us that making a river a, bo a border attempts to minimize the wider ecosystem perspective. In other words, the bordering process reduces a diverse and rich environment to a trespass line in a national cultural imaginary, when it is always more than this, as is clear in the experience of those trying to cross it. This reduction obfuscates how bordering conditions the environment to be adversarial, while also impacting the river itself. So, where river waters stand between and perhaps more importantly, blur the binarisms of connection, division, and life and death. Here, the border regimes mobilize the river's ambiguities to produce a condition of ecological exception and violent excess. One of the key questions we have been asking for a number of years in this context, in relation to the Everos, is what is the role of water in the politics of death at the border? Opposing the material and discursive reproduction of both rivers and borders as natural, weaponizing a river identifies the Evros Merich Maritza as the result of multiple organizational technologies of territorial sovereignty. Following the First World War and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the Luzerne Peace Treaty identified the Evros Merich as the border and instigated a multilateral demarcation committee. The committee in turn deemed that the border should not follow the changes in the route of the river, but instead be fixed to its 1926 course. Efforts to fix the riverbanks to this 1926 condition have been hampered by wider political tension, but also by the agency of the river itself, where it has carried away border markers and indeed border fences. This means that there is now almost 100 years of fluvio-geomorphological variation between the drawn border and the river that it once followed. As far as demarcation is concerned, once the line has been drawn, the water itself is no longer relevant. Thus, at least two rivers and two borders exist in the example of the Everos Merich. The cartographic border of the old median line and that of the new course, which has become the water of the new trespass line, but not the political border. 
fell here, the river moves over the border and at places the border becomes dewatered. The specific border water of the Avros marriage has emerged in this century since the Auvergne, where hydrosocial and relational thinking increasingly understands rivers as containing concentrations of multiple social, political, and material conditions. Borders, on the other hand, are increasingly understood as a diffusion of power and surveillance across technological, socio-cultural, and environmental processes, often far from drawn lines of ports of entry. The border regime appropriates the riverine characteristics of flow, erosion, mud, turbulence, and fog, as much as it is founded on military technology, agricultural and conservation practices, the geopolitics of resource logistics, and border crossing. In other words, not only are waters harnessed as an external medium of border violence, they also internalize this politics. This produces a water that is heavily polluted, susceptible to flooding, increasingly saline close to the delta, and, most tellingly, burying the bodies of those people displaced by conflict and illegalized in their attempts to claim asylum. We discussed the impact of geopolitical conditions on the river ecosystem with the fish scientist, Dr. Stamatis Zogaris, from the Hellenic Center for Marine Research. The most economic river in Europe, where um, there is no conservation management of any kind, really, in terms of flow. It's just, for example, in Spain, one of the most toxic, major toxic uh, uh, waste in the river that separates it from uh, the further human uh, parts of the river. It's one of the reasons it's so connected to that is the river has a cascade. Really, it's not uh, it's, it's found that on um, the side of the uh, small river country on the um, So when you never run the river, you have to buy flat or you have duck river. So this, this river basin has a lot of uh, dynamic wind and a lot of water coming to it. Um, and that uh, obviously helps to protect the system, provide a lot of flood. The other thing, uh, there's between 200 and something kilometers between these completely uh, unique parts of the Bulgarian that have no real barriers, no real gaps, uh, so to speak, in the river. They don't really do it. So that means there's a, a connection with the marine system and to the central water system. And I believe this has a different magnitude. Uh, so this is issue is over 45. This section of river continues to be shadowed by a military buffer zone, extending as far as the main roads and railway line built on the levees that control the floodplain. Access to the buffer zone is tightly controlled and photography is prohibited, creating a scarce image regime, clear limitations for research and gaps in knowledge regarding the river, hence why we're using so many maps and not the actual kind of images produced at the border itself. Um, the legal scholar Dr. Valentina Azarova from D Border Collective shared some of her thoughts on this with us. This trajectory of, of knowing more and more by mistake and increasing secrecy. You know, the last government of hearing and all humanitarians were excluded from Ecco, excluded from Bulgaria. And, and indeed the knowing, right? Or the search, you know, the lack of knowledge. But then the, the 
found that in the case of the bordering practices used in rivers like the Avros Merich, that rather than control, states accommodate the river's changes, harness the ambiguity in producing a space in a constant process of redefinition where knowledge is obscured in the shifting riverscape. The border's ecology of exception is made possible by both the river's adaptability to force, its flexibility, and indeed the river's own force. The capricious shifts of the river across drawn lines produce islands of stranded land, ambiguous spaces within and around which territorial processes become most deadly. In this image, a large meander neck has been cut by either a change of flow or more likely through the straightening of the course. There now exists an expanse of Greek earth on the wrong side of the river. There are also equivalent examples of land ceded to Turkey on the Greek side. These ambiguous parcels of land are also points where fatalities become concentrated. Professor Pavlos Pavlidis, coroner of Evros Prefecture and authority on post-mortem conditions in the region, identifies this particular area near Therese, just north of the delta, as the location where 72 bodies were recovered between 2000 and 2014. In late February 2020, the Evros Merich became a flashpoint when the Turkish government opened its borders with Greece in an attempt to exert pressure on the EU over conflict in Syria. It directed thousands of refugees to the Evros Merich with the false promise of an open route to Europe. The Greek government responded by suspending its uh, asylum system and deploying police and military forces in the region. Tensions lasted for several days during which at least two asylum seekers lost their lives to Greek bullets, including the murder of Mohammed Al-Arab on March the 2nd, 2020. Forensic architecture found that Greek soldiers were using a now dry section of riverbed in the delta, not far from this section shown here, as a trench from which to fire at asylum seekers stranded on such a parcel of land. When the dry section of the riverbed is itself the border, the isolated area it produces becomes a no man's land caught between two countries, between the borderline and the border river, neither entirely one nor the other, but a space in which the Greek state at least seems to think that it can act with impunity. These gaps in knowledge are increasingly, man increasingly manipulated at the sedimentary river islands. Sorry, that was uh, Domatis Vagaris. Um, so this territorial uncertainty or this kind of ecosystemic uncertainty utilized by the border apparatus can lead to a deadly confusion for those trying to cross. As Kize, who crossed the river and was returned to Turkey as many as six times in search of asylum in May 2019, described when we spoke with him in February 2020. Thank you.
As key points in the contestation of control of no and control of knowledge surrounding the border, the islands are where some of the most brutal violence administered by the respective border regimes take place. We discuss these gaps in knowledge further with Valentina and Silvia Simonidis from D Border, and initially we'll hear Stefanos's voice first. Question of, of the, the border frontiers and frontier state of constructed times one where um, things that elsewhere would not be possible dare and happen. Uh, and frontier has been supposed to construct as a space that goes across, right? Or a space of a line. Um, whereas London than ever for most borders, for example, has been a space of explorers, but I feel the space of hyper reality is essential, right? So you have this, this overlap of access that puts them over lots of access and creates this this uh, space for infinity uh, because each side of infinity has broken down. Um, and this uh, this is something that's compounded whenever this is a very geometric system that is very rigid, right? Because the the river itself moves, but the border doesn't. And that's the that's the island that um, I thought was referring to in the beginning. Um, the sandbank in the river itself, which we see now more and more being treated as spaces of uh, ambiguous spatial or kind of that legal um, status, uh, and mobilized for pushback, which wasn't the case when we write in our, our pieces, actually. Um, we were reading, and I'm sure you feel that you read these reports, we're reading more and more reports of people being taken to these islands rather than progressive each time, and being left there. Uh, my assumption is that these borders are presumed that people who don't want to step foot on patients' land and risk being apprehended or coming face to face with, with public security control. But, but it's interesting how this overlap of the, 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 the natural ambiguity and the, and the legal ambiguity of the uh, of the region produces a space of. Well, I guess my question is is, is, is it a hyper legal space or is it a legal space? Yeah. Thank you. 
number of procedures in that area, especially when it comes to teaching in the art evaluation and also uh, the web animation. Among the many politicians who visited during the March 2020 event was the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Accompanied by Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, von der Leyen gave a statement in which he praised Greece for being Europe's Aspidos, the Greek word for shield. Her choice of vocabulary echoes local military discourse in which the region is often called Greece's anachoma, or embankment, against Turkish invasion, and more recently, against asylum seekers. Reflecting the historic and ongoing tension between Greece and Turkey, the military buffer zone runs parallel to the river, also known as the Zone of Security and Coverage, or ZAC, with a width that varies from a couple of hundred meters to a few kilometers from the river, coinciding with the extent of the floodplains. The 10,000 square kilometer buffer zone is densely surveilled. Driving through this cross-border landscape, it is quickly evident that the floodplain of the Evros Merit is sculpted to either contain or facilitate movement, be it military personnel, civilians, or water. Part of this manipulation comes in the form of flood defense berms, or levees, raised embankments that often act as roads in the floodplain. These levees often double as military and anti-tank installations, with concrete tunnels running within and intermittent foxholes punctuating the embanked earth. A new 26 kilometer long fence is currently under construction around the isolated parcels of land we saw before. These will also, according to the Greek Minister of Citizens Protection, quote, take into account the geomorphology of the region and will be constructed to act as a flood defense infrastructure for the protection of settlements and fields. And so you see in this kind of infrastructure the imbrication of national security and um, um, in ecological uh, management. The very drawing of a fixed yet imaginary borderline along the central course of the river and the second one along the limits of the floodplain effectively produces a river as a frontier, conditioning its movements and muds to become sites where sovereign territorial imaginaries are projected. It is such a legal territorial imaginary that turns the vectors and fluid dynamics, the muds and airs of the river into a weapon, the anachema in its many forms. <laughs> the diplomat Elias Dimitrakopoulos in his 1988 treaty, The Land Borders of Greece, describes the deltaic terrain as, quote, unnavigable during spring and winter. The median depth of the river at the delta is two to three meters deep, and the flow rate is 3,200 cubic meters an hour during the summer. The Greek bank is almost entirely swamp, while the Turkish bank is somewhat higher and steep, until the point where the Evros meets the Ergine River, where there is a swamp as well. A Ramsar designated wetland of international importance, the delta's waters, ponds, and islands are home to a number of migratory bird species. In the navigation uh, area for cultural levels that belong to the, the individual understanding, in, in the Everest, uh, as a character, where was it? When I was three years old, when I was 13 years old. I first saw the other section, so my, my interest um, is, is really quite much older, you know, and I, it sounds kind of legendary, you know, in terms of my wish to escape the area I am in, the land of the birds, to, to indeed be able to fashion uh, people there, especially before you were there and all that, you would, you would tell yourself about going to the dark side. Pockets made of money, so I, I, had, really, I would go fly. It, 
15 kilometers wide and filled with marshes and ponds, the delta can take days to cross. People use this route due to its remoteness and looser patrolling compared to more inhabited parts of the river. The following clip is of a group of people wading across the delta. After many years of research on the Everest, the only video we have of the crossing of the delta is this, five seconds. They are wading through the, com the turbid waters out in the open in the middle of the day. Their wading is taxing, water weighing down their clothes, while they are vulnerable to multiplicity of threats. We repeat the video because this five seconds was only a brief moment in a much longer journey of repetition, one that started long before the river and often involves a series of repeated pushbacks once at the river border itself. These people are wading through a dense overlap of environmental, geopolitical, legal and cultural actors that produce the Everest as at one and the same time a riverized border and a borderized river more so than anywhere else along the river. In the delta, the border exists beyond the riverbank. It is in the reeds and stagnant water, in the mud of the expanded flood meadows, as well as in the impenetrable riparian vegetation. Indeed, Cusay describes this when recounting the experience of pulling himself out of the river at night. There is perhaps no more fitting a line to describe the weaponization of the river ecosystem than Cusay's memory of being hurt by whatever he touched. This is an environment that is conditioned to hurt those who attempt to navigate it. In March 2020, while the storks and pelicans were flocking in and the flamingos were preparing to head south for the summer, the Delta hosted a different kind of migration, with army and police units operating side by side with local self-proclaimed frontiersmen, guardians of the border, and hunting clubs arriving from all over Greece. Joining them were far-right and neo-Nazi militants from elsewhere in Europe and the US to help, quote, safeguard Europe's borders, end quote. Showing little regard for human life, rifle in arm, these militias described their operations as, quote, hunting for refugees, end quote. Throughout March 2020, the Delta was the anachema in full effect. As we've suggested, this anachema takes multiple forms. During the winter and spring months, the morning fog is at its thickest, as Cusay describes during his multiple crossings of the Delta. In March 2020, this fog conjured an old and menacing metaphor. As reported in the media at the time, the paramilitaries who were drawn to the area to hunt crosses, quote, at night and in the fog, 
end quote, were transposing the old Nazi directive, Nazi Bibel, Nike Fog, onto the Everest Delta. Journalists on the ground also spoke of an informational fog, shrouding events, referring to the diverging accounts emerging from both sides and their inability to corroborate them due to the border being inaccessible to journalists and civilians. The clouded mediatic landscape is symptomatic of the floodplain buffer zone and is purposefully maintained to make the Everest unintelligible for non-military bodies. The fog analogy is particularly as potent when considered against the numerous report reports of secret pushbacks, arbitrary detention, torture and death in a floodplain. This has been legally framed by the Global Legal Action Network as enforced disappearances. As in Nazi Germany in the 1940s, people in the Everest disappear at night and within fog, be it physical or informational, material or metaphoric, often nullius nomen, without trace or name. So rather than being a natural border, the Delta is an exemplary case of a border nature where environmental elements, which are not deadly on their own, are made deadly by forcing people to traverse them under treacherous conditions. Through our analysis of the Everest Merich, we think with the river in the attempt to disentangle the full extent of the river border infrastructure. Border and water knowledges overlap here and fold into the management of the floodplain, producing an entire ecosystem as a border technology to the extent that one could say the Everest region is all river and it is all border. Thinking the border through islands and through the delta in this way disambiguates its production as a simple geographic and ethnic demarcation when it is always operated in dispersed and muddy ways beyond the reductive binarisms border regimes try to sustain. So, to assist migrants in defending their rights, to counter the obfuscating tactics deployed by the police in their use of the river as alibi, and to confront the far right that assembles its forces rhetorically, environmentally, and in person in the Delta from seeping into increasingly xenophobic societies, the very concept of nature needs to be reframed to encompass the ways it is deployed within the military imaginary. Understanding the complexity of the river as a weaponized border ecology is crucial to reveal the ongoing and intensifying violence that unfolds across different scales in the region. Thus, practices must be developed to perceive, hear, see, and sense how border regimes harness environmental processes, to see the river as a continuum from freezing fog in the valleys, dew in the fields, mud in the floodplain, and carried on the clothes and the bodies of people forced to cross as clearly as, it is, as, as we see it as water flowing between the riverbanks themselves. Such practices reveal the varying watery fates of the Everest Merich as what they are, the riverine arsenal of a deadly defense architecture, an entire region designed as a dispersed territorial technology, as a violent anachrona. However, our conversation has also revealed another side of the river and the possibility of some hope. So we leave you with Dr. Zogaris and the river itself. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We are a little bit behind schedule, but I think we can take questions. And I would like to open the floor. We have about five minutes, I think, six to seven minutes for questions.
Good morning. Thank you for the presentation. I, I think it's a very, very interesting topic. I think it connects very well with uh, Rebecca's presentation before. And I think generally just taking a more ecocentric approach because in the last 20 years there have been kind of a trend of granting legal rights to rivers, right? And it was in 2008 in Ecuador, it was in 2017 in New Zealand and in Bangladesh where rivers have very at larger importance. Do you see Everest as a good candidate for that? And specifically due to its multifaceted nature, and I think same question goes also for the Moselle River. Is this an interesting candidate for legal rights granting or as an entity? I think that's a, it's a sort of two-part question in some ways. I think the, the first first point would be that the granting of legal personhood is 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 is, is, not, is not necessarily the ideal condition. I understand that in certain cases it can be the only route, or one of many, but an effective route for the uh, environmental protection. But it also raises other questions about legal structures and legal systems, and and what is what is the law that is then being. Uh, um, afforded to a river, and I'm not sure it's always going to work in the river's system. So maybe it's the other question is to maybe critique what the law is rather than giving laws to, uh, giving legal personhood to an environmental figure. Um, however, I mean, in an ideal sense, it would be great if the Everos had greater protection. Um, however, it's so far off. Um, I mean, Stamatis is able to access it um, studying as, a, as an environmentalist, but actually that, that's not necessarily always been the case. In many ways, in many of his papers are only done via um, remote sensing because he cannot access um, the water. So it's, it's very complicated. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many other elements to this and, and they're including the dams in the, in the Bulgarian um, Maritza element of the river. So it's, uh, it's a complicated, Story. I think in an ideal world, yes, there would be, <laughs> yes, but in, uh, in reality, I think that's so far off, yeah, yeah. So if I'm reading the satellite images correctly, it looks like a lot of the, the delta is surrounded by pretty heavily subdivided cropland. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you could speak to the agricultural history component of what's happening here, both in terms of, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking about that in two ways. On, on one hand, it's there's a, a local knowledge that comes with agriculture that seems kind of counterintuitive compared to this like much larger geopolitical context in which a lot of the border politics are playing out. But then also from like a deeper history point of view, you can think about agriculture as kind of the original sin in terms of the, 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 the beginning of the type of environmental approach that sees nature as instrumentalist. And so, um, and so in, in that larger way, I wonder if there's even some kind of connection to be made. But what, what has been your experience and what are your insights into the growing region that is flanking the river on both sides? Yeah, this is a great question, and of course, it, it, it would have a, maybe too large an answer for for this particular moment. But um, certainly, the, the agricultural practices in the Turkish side and in the Greek side differ greatly. Um, so there's lots of rice, particularly in the Turkish side, towards the delta. Most of the delta on, on the Greek side is actually Ramsar protected, so it does have a kind of uh, conservationist perspective, even though that's also enfolded into the military kind of um, control of the region. Um, but, it, but, but your question raises another important point. Um, the river before 1923 was a space of communication. There was a, a thriving um, silk industry all along uh, the river, and you could, you could take it all the way up to Plovdiv in, in Bulgaria, and there were boats coming down, so much like the Mosul in some, in some ways in this respect. What you happened in 1923 is also this huge population exchange. So... Um, Many of the Greek identifying people in the Black Sea area and in Anatolia kind of came back to Greece, so to speak, back. I mean, it's a, it's a complex phrase. What is the new Greece in that, at that moment? And many of the Turkish Muslim people, identifying people, were then exchanged back into what was then became 
modern-day Turkey. Um, and so you see these kind of, there are lots of layers of history there. There are still, in this area, the biggest populations of ethnic Turkish um, Muslim communities. And many of those are given the responsibility of handling the bodies of those found in the river who are assumed to be of Muslim um, background. Um, so there, there's a really complicated stories there. However, the farmers and the fishermen also provide really important access to research in the sense that how we were able to get to the river was because we went to, and this is what you do when you're doing research, we were really uh, disappointed because one of our meetings didn't work out and then um, we were in an anarchist bar in this really like, peripheral town. A guy came over and started speaking to us and said, oh, I'll take you to the river, I have some fields there. And so we were able to access it and that was the only possibility. Um, so farmers do provide this knowledge, they provide an understanding. And there's also a complexity there in relationship to surveillance. Some farmers are enfolded into the surveillance regime, whereas others have a political agenda that is slightly different. So this whole kind of agricultural um, and, and, and fishing and, and hunting has a really complex story in, in a region like this. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. And I think we are coming now to our last presentation for the morning. And I briefly would like to introduce CJ Alvarez uh, uh, to you, uh, who grew up in Las Cruces, New Mexico. He studied art. Uh, history at Stanford and Harvard and received his doctorate in history from the University of Chicago. He's currently an associate professor in the Department of Mexican American and uh, Latino Latina Studies at the University of Texas at Austin, where he writes and teaches about the history of the U.S.-Mexican border and environmental history. He is the author of the book Border Land, Border Water, A History of Construction um, on the U.S.-Mexico Divide, uh, his first broad sweeping history of building projects on the border. And he is currently writing a book about the history of the Chihuahuan Desert, the largest and least known desert in North America. It's a great pleasure to have you here. I'm looking forward to conversations afterwards and now you will give us a talk and you will bring us a uh, full circle so to speak to the Rio Grande which is you know our river upstairs right mm -hmm. uh, three ways to think about river history with examples from the Rio Grande Rio Bravo thank you very much and please join me in welcoming <laughs> CJ Alvarez thank you so much Astrid and thank you all for being here and thank you so much uh Dom for the invitation and for the support staff here, and uh, of course to Zoe and Tim, when they first reached out to me with an invitation to contribute an essay to the collected volume accompanying the, the exhibition catalog, I was initially very skeptical because in the United States there's, it's become a cottage industry um, for people to kind of come to the border, do some stuff, do some quick field research, and go somewhere else. You have to understand that Despite the, the, the infamy or the fame of the U.S.-Mexico border in North America um, and, and even globally, the vast majority of Americans and the vast majority of Mexicans have never been there. But if they have been there, they've been to one place, one, one crossing. And so I was, I was skeptical of, uh, of what, what it might look like. And when I saw some sample prints of this uh, absolutely magnum opus that Zoe had, had produced, I, I realized when I looked at the way she was seeing the border, the way she was framing the border, and most importantly how she was seeing and framing the river, I, I realized that I, I had to jump at the chance to be part of this project. And now here I am, um, uh, greatly honored to, to be here actually and see it in person. Um, I also think that as I was walking through it with, um, with the gracious uh, Sarah Beaumont the other day, I, it really struck me that there's no wall text, there's no title, and I, it, I realized that I 
had a, I have a very unusual relationship with this show because having spent really my entire life along the river and along the border, I could recognize pretty much every single location from which she was shooting. And so I didn't need wall text and I didn't need, um, and I didn't need titles. And I also have a familiarity with what we might call US-Mexico border iconography in terms of just the, the um, border patrol stuff, river engineering stuff, certainly fence stuff. And, and E4 is fascinating because we have the opposite problem on the US-Mexico border. I think it's, it's oversaturated with imagery in a lot of ways. And I think that a lot of journalistic photography, not really, uh, definitely kind of takes the bait of of photographing the most intentionally designed to be photogenic aspects of the security apparatus, um, particularly with fence. And so all of this made me think, well, I might actually be the, the worst possible viewer for this, uh, for, 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 this, um, for this exhibition insofar as it's easy for me to read it in a, from a documentary point of view. And that's why I'm so looking forward to the, um, to the afternoon session as well when we get into not just the materiality of the river, but the materiality of the artistic production, because I think for me at least there's a, there's a real tension between the, the documentary and geographic components of the exhibition and then the artistic, um, I think, the, uh, um, challenges that it, that it issues to us in, in terms of the scope, in terms of the size of the print, in terms of the absence of um, of, of text in association with the images. So I couldn't be happier to, to be here and, and share a few thoughts. These are the thoughts. A lot of what I'm going to say is actually exactly the same things that the previous two presenters have said, but in a different order and seen from a different, a different perspective and in a different geographical context. But I thought the two first presentations just could not have been better. And, and it's, it's an honor to, to follow you both. It's really organized around three questions, three research questions that I as a historian, lapsed art historian, have, um, have, have developed in part largely organically by being out in the field and being out there along the, the river and along the line. Um, and so, yeah, that's the, that's the plan. The first question, oh, this is with my title slide. That's the watershed. We'll talk about that in a second, in more detail. The first way to think about it is to focus on the river. And the question behind this is, what is the river's nature? And then both Ifor and, and Rebecca have signaled the, the importance of thinking holistically in terms of hydrological systems. But I want to go a bit deeper into the implications both cross-disciplinary and also philosophically about what that really means to go deeper into river history that focuses on, um, on, on the river itself and the watershed. So this mode of analysis takes its primary object as the river itself. And this is an obvious thing in the realm of the sciences. This is the sort of the bread and butter of, um, of hydrology, botany, hydrologic cases, um, and so on and so forth. We could just list all the different disciplines, but it goes without saying in the context of uh, field science and laboratory science this, that, the, that the watershed itself is integrated and that, um, and that that means something ecologically and environmentally. And so from this point of view, there's focus on water quality, there's focus on riparian zone biology, there's focus on from the point of view of ancient, the reconstruction of ancient environments, uh, ancestral riverbeds where the river once was uh, and, um, and what its flow might have looked like then and been like then. But I think that a focus on the river also speaks to the realm of philosophy and what we can think of as an ecocentric approach. And we can have a conversation about the extent to which ecocentrism is different or similar to posthumanism or even misanthropy. Um, but um, 
from this point of view, we understand the natural world as intrinsically important, both living things, animals, plants, but also even in its most extreme forms, abiotic, that is non-living things, rocks, geology, and that sort of thing, as having their own kind of will, their own kind of um, uh, intrinsic importance. And from, a, from an activist standpoint, we see this kind of philosophical approach unfold in the context of efforts to rewild rivers, rebend rivers, to take dams out, um, and focus on wild and scenic. I know you mentioned a, a section. We have these little sections in rivers. It's like this is the wild part. Everything else is not. But <laughs> but that's how that's how it often <laughs> works, which is its own kind of fu funny little uh, contradiction. And then, of course, on pollution uh, uh, and, and the benefit of, um, of other species, or even um, uh, not, not species at all. So keep bearing all this in mind, let's take a closer look at the, at the watershed itself. So um, as, as Rebecca and Anifor both pointed out, I think so well, the, the question of rivers is fundamentally a question of intellectual history and the kinds of taxonomies that we use to divide up territory and space. And I think going back to Christian's question earlier about why are people so interested in borders, I think it, in some ways it represents the, um, the almost complete domination in, the, in our modern minds of of political borders as the the only way of dividing up space. But from a scientific point of view, and certainly from a, a purely river history point of view, what we find is the the natural but the real right um, boundary that exists is of the of the of the watershed as of the catchment basin. And you can see that here in the context of the United States and, and Mexico. You can see the major Mexican tributaries, you can see the, um, the major U.S. tributaries, and of course the river, the main stem of the river doesn't make sense outside of thinking about those, the other contributors. And this is especially the case in the context of the Rio Grande, which is where some sections of it run completely dry. We just got a, some, some uh, JPEG snapshots from Zoe the other day, which is a surreal experience, getting a, <laughs> getting a, a iPhone photo from Zoe uh, who's in West Texas right now, uh, showing us that the river there is now completely dry, whereas in the bottom, uh, in, the, in the delta, it's not. And that, of course, has to do with the, with, the, with the larger dynamics of the river. So we see this in the context of uh, six states, four on the Mexican side, two on the American side. Of course, the river doesn't care. Of course, in most cases, scientists don't care either. And so that, that beyond political border perspective is something that is baked in to the scientific, um, to the scientific approach, to the approach of many scientists, which I think is very interesting and, and also represents the, the cultural gap between disciplines as much as it does um, anything else. But what I really want to point out here in the context of this map and then this satellite map here. And you can tell we are all of us river people who love Google Earth and satellite maps. It's en endlessly useful for asking questions and, and demonstrating some of these concepts. I want to point out and speak for a few minutes about the question of scale, which I think is um, a re really important and an interesting aspect to this, especially here in uh, Europe where where you're working on different kinds of scales, oftentimes. And so I think that's interesting just in terms of context, but I think it's interesting in terms of the larger um, the uh, 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 intellectual uh, implications of this kind of work. So this desert here, the Chihuahuan Desert, which I'll show you a picture of later, is about Uh, about that area, it's about the size of Germany. So, and the Rio Grande itself 
is longer than any river in Western Europe. It's, a, it's about the length of the Danube. Um, so it's really just a, a absolutely way off the chart in terms of the, the land mass of Western Europe. But more importantly than that, it moves between very, very different ecosystems. And that's what this slide here on the right is meant to show. If you can just, in your mind, imagine, kind of transpose this map to that map, which is basically the same scale. You can see that the headwaters of the Rio Grande start in very, very high mountains, about 4,500 meters. So um, you might have altitude sickness, high altitude. And then, of course, it drains into the Gulf of Mexico, where it is um, subtropical climate. Palm trees, the whole nine yards. I can't take it down there. It's way too humid and, and, and too hot for me. And then the, the main chunk of it, which is passing through here, is passing through a desert. A desert the likes of which doesn't exist in Europe. And so we find that the river has different characteristics it, intrinsically, but then ultimately we'll find it has different characteristics sociologically, uh, depending on where you are in um, not just the watershed, but where you even are on the main stem, precisely because this is a river that is making a very significant journey, not just over space, but also it's tumbling downwards thousands of meters. And from that point of view, it is descending quite rapidly, even though it's, it's so long. And that has implications for where, where we are in any given part of the watershed. I think that something that hasn't been talked about thus far is something that I've become very, very interested in and have had a lot of intellectual trouble with in recent months and probably will have for, for many years to come is scale not just in terms of space, but scale in terms of time. And if you really want to do river history and take seriously the prospect of the river itself or the watershed itself more, you know, more, more accurately as the object of analysis, you have to completely demolish uh, a, a periodization that is rooted in anything that resembles a human lifetime. And you have to go back into geologic time. And that is something that is very difficult to do cognitively. It's not easy for our minds to grasp deep time. It's not easy to do as a historian because unlike in the context of European archaeology, where archaeology has a textual si sidebar, a textual component that goes back millennia, we don't in North America. Texts, as we know it, alphabetic systems, don't uh, really arrive until the 16th century, even though human history goes back 20,000 years. And so we have a, 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 a very serious methodological problem in that sense. And then you have a, a, a a, a component of that, which is the scientists, they already have a language for all of this stuff. And it's very impenetrable for, for people who have not been versed in the shibboleths and the jargon of, of, of what it all means. And so what I've been struggling with as a historian is trying to figure out how to narrativize in a way that, um, that takes seriously the non-human components but also doesn't just reproduce scientific language that I don't understand um, and that, that arguably doesn't matter in the context of trying to tell, uh, tell a deeper story. And so I don't have a solution here. I have um, only a set of problems, but a set of problems that I find quite liberating to get out of, uh, to, to try to not be a human as, as much as I can, to try to not fall into the set of assumptions that my human brain and that, um, and, that a, and that a world dominated today, and by today I mean the last 200 years, let's say, by political territorialization has, um, has imposed upon me. And so 
this is the realm of river history that I've been exploring the most deeply and, um, and the one that I'm most excited about. But I think that the most common approach that we see is the focus on people. And this, we can contrast the, with the ecocentric approach with the obviously anthropocentric approach. What worries me oftentimes is the extent to which the anthropocentric approach is adopted as the only obvious approach. It's just a self-evident given for how one asks questions about the world, which is again why I find the, the, river, uh, the river itself history so interesting. This kind of literature produced on human-centered approaches is far more visible, I think, to the wider reading public and to journalism compared to the scientific literature. But don't forget, there is this vast literature of scientific writing about rivers all over the, all over the world. It's just less available and accessible to a lot of people. And so again, there's this, there's this, um, there's this territorialization, as it were, of be, uh, between not just the disciplines, but between, between the sciences and humanities. Of course, uh, as recently as the 19th century, that uh, didn't exist, that kind of si siloization of, um, of intellectual inquiry. And so the two questions that we often find in the anthropocentric approach, and this is classic environmental history 101, is what do people do to the natural world? and what does the natural world do for people? And a, a good example of this from the US-Mexico border is this place here, which is right where the river becomes the border. This is from the 1960s. And what you're looking at here is El Paso, Texas. On the left, the United States, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, uh, Mexico on the right. And then of course you can see the channel of the Rio Grande there. This is important for several reasons. Um, th and again, the first presentations are so fascinating. So the, we operate on the, on the legal doctrine of Salwich. So the, the deepest channel of the river is the border. And so if the river moves, so does the border. Terrible idea for, for a modern border to, 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 to designate uh, a river at all, but certainly a desert river. And this is where the ecosystem approach makes a difference because desert rivers, more than humid land rivers, tend to move more frequently. We can talk about why if you're interested. So the river moved in the 1860s, 100 years of arbitration and litigation take place between the United States and Mexico until we get to the 1960s. When you can see here uh, on this uh, photograph, this yellow line, actually stickers on the, on the photograph itself, designate where they were going to move the channel to. So you can see this. I, don't, I feel like I shouldn't tell people what, <laughs> what, what, which pictures are what upstairs, uh, but suffice it to say, there, there, there are photographs of, the, of this, uh, this place that Zoe took. And, um, and the solution here was to completely encase it in, in uh, trapezoidal concrete and, um, and discipline the river in a way that was commensurate with the necessities of 20th century borders mm -hmm. that increasingly more and more uh, had to be very, very fixed and very precisely delineated. So w when we look at the river from an anthropocentric lens, it's important to recognize that we are almost always looking at just one part of the river. So obviously the river's really long, the river's really, um, the river has all these tributaries, et cetera, but that doesn't matter in the context of localized, um, in, in the context of local places. And we saw this in the first two, in the first two presentations as well. And it's not a bad thing, that's just part of the phenomenon of what the anthropocentric approach looks like. And that's the tension 
between the river as a whole and then the river as a, as a particular site that causes some kind of, or that influences somehow human behavior, human uh, organization. And then there is a focus on policy. What, what kinds of policies have been superimposed upon a river or on a border? And this, of course, is a variation on the theme of an anthropocentric approach because it's, a, it's entirely within the context of human institutions, even if it's on behalf of other species or on behalf of uh, the, the non-living world. And um, the focus on policy, I find, tends toward a macroscopic scale. So more and more, especially since the 1990s in the United States and in Mexico, when we talk about the border, we're not really talking about the border at all. We're talking about immigration policy as it pertains to the border. And in that regard, there is a, there's the macroscopic lens works and makes sense because it's a federal ground and, and that, that has an evenly distributed um, set of requirements and um, not an evenly distributed kind of enforcement, but you get the idea. This kind of history, and again, I'm getting back to a, the question of time scale, is a, a very short, shallow chronology. It's organized along the lines of when were the policies enacted, when were the treaties enacted, when were the statutes passed by Congress about immigration, when, was, when were the drug wars, and so on and so forth. And so there is a, there is a built-in assumption of scale that we find in all of these approaches that I try, that, that one, of the, one of the challenges I've issued myself and certainly I try to issue to my students is to, is to become more self-aware about the kinds of, uh, of time scale assumptions in particular that, that we're making when we start to ask these questions. So this map here on the left is a good example of a policy map. It's a, it's a map that exclusively focuses on the, the political borders of both the Mexican states, the U.S. states, and then the U.S.-Mexico border. And as you can see here, the river isn't even there, even though, of course, that's all river. Um, and of course, the river continues on upward into, into Colorado, into the high mountains. And so when the river stops being the border, people stop being interested in it from the point of view of policy analysis. But as you can see from the image on the right, the built environment is also read oftentimes as an expression of policy, and I think rightly so. And so what we're looking at here is actually not the river. We're looking at an irrigation ditch, a canalized irrigation ditch that has diverted water from the river and is moving it to an agricultural zone, which is why I'm always interested in agricultural zones in borders. And then, of course, you're looking at the pedestrian fence, um, part of the, the big mega project fence building that started in 2000 seven-ish, and um, has cost unknown billions of dollars. And, um, and of course, the fence here is a physical manifestation of policy, but not local policy, a, a policy that is really only meaningful if you put it into the context of a national political sensibility that gave rise to a federal project that size and scope of the border fence to begin with. Um, and this is in contrast to what is uh, a, a very local set of policies, which is the, the irrigation ditch right there. And, and Rebecca, the, the buoy and the water is just absolutely fascinating to me because even in the context of the tie borders of 
Chihuahua, Mexico, New Mexico, and Texas, USA, where you would think that the US-Mexico border could, could not be more better delineated. There was an incident um, at the start of the last drug war in 2007 when Mexican President Calderon sent um, troops to the northern border and they intentionally bring them from other parts of Mexico so they don't have local connections. And they accidentally cross the empty riverbed thinking the irrigation ditch was the river because that's where the water actually was. So all the water had been siphoned out for agricultural reasons. Then because the US Border Patrol has this zero tolerance policy, they were forced to arrest a bunch of Mexican soldiers, which led to an absolute like diplomatic disaster and forced this big summit where they all met in the, the this building in the ceded land that you just saw in, in what we call the Chamisal to get everybody on the same page, all these federal agencies on Mex in Mexican side and the U.S. side, be like, where actually is the border? And who's allowed to cross it and who isn't and, 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 and in what context? And so I want to I close by introducing you to, to my limited solution to some of these problems that I worked on in my, in my first book about the border. And this came about based on an interest in what I think of as alternative cartography, how we can use not just photography, like A4 was talking about, but also different ways of map making to represent these kinds of border spaces in a way that feels more real, at least to me, as a, as a border person in, uh, in North America. And so I kept track as I was editing my book manuscript of every single place name that I mentioned. And not just political place names, but also desert, mountain, physical infrastructure, et cetera. And I hired this brilliant map maker and I gave it to him and I said, can you get all this onto a single map? And the answer was yes. This is, this is the map of the US-Mexico border that I worked from in my book. And he did a lot of brilliant things in this map, including uh, including different line weights on the river so you can actually see the difference in discharge. In other words, like how much water is in different parts of the river. So it gives you a much better sense of the, the actual working aspects of, of, the, of the much larger hydrological system. But then also the, um, but then also the way that it interacts with policy development so often expressed through infrastructure projects. And so when he showed me this, and of course it's the physical map, so you can see the topography, you can see the different deserts which matter um, for reasons which we can talk about. And you can see that, uh, that there are in fact a, a wide range of different kinds of environments with which this ostensibly legally unified border passes through. And so when I saw this map, I said, that's, that's the map I've always wanted. That's the map that looks and feels the realest to me as a border person, even in uh, a, a very contested border zone like the, the U.S.-Mexico border. And I would also like to point out one thing in closing here, and that is, don't forget, there's this whole western border too. And as you can see in the map here, it's largely, it's straight line. And so the United States, Canada, and Mexico in the 19th century broke the mold um, from a European perspective on kind of solving a lot of border problems in advance by simply just taking a bearing and drawing a straight line on the sand. And those borders are very easy to, to manage. When they demarcated the Rio Grande as the, as the international border in the 1840s, they, uh, they, would, they were doing what people had been doing in Europe for millennia, and that is using mountains and rivers as just natural ways to divide, uh, to, to divide territory without anticipating the extent to which in the 20th century, and especially in the 21st century, the degree of precision that would be expected of international divides would be completely transformed. And that a river 
and most importantly, a desert river is the, is the worst choice you could possibly make for, for a human national border. Um, and so, so don't forget that there's more border than just the river, and there's more river than just the river border. Thank you so much um, for this wonderful talk. Um, I hope you're willing to take questions because I'm oh, sure. Of course. Yeah, of course. I'm sure there are questions, and I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. So before we can go upstairs and have lunch and look at the pictures, and I'll go first, <laughs> and also look at the Borderland project. Yeah. Uh, thank you, CJ. That was really very interesting. I didn't realize that the Rio Concho from Mexico actually contributes to the Rio Grande further down by Amistad uh, Dam. But the United States also controls the Elephant Butte, right? And they, that's why the, the water doesn't run through El Paso as much as it used to. Yeah. Or at, le at least last time I was there, it's been raining a lot lately. Yeah. And I noticed that the river is pretty full. Uh, even in, you know, today. But what about the Bolsones? Can you talk a little bit about the reserv the other water underneath that El Paso is dependent upon and how do the countries uh, conserve and, you know, uh, use, utilize and share those resources? Yeah, well, first of all, the Rio Conchos is, um, is a is a very important Mexican tributary, and in fact, the the drought that we've had this summer. There was just two campesinos, like kind of field agricultural workers, just killed in a protest by federal troops in in Mexico recently, protesting releases from the Bofia Dam on the Rio Conchos because uh, they didn't want more water to be released to the U.S. side. And of course, the reason that they that the, the federal government of Mexico was releasing water to the U.S. side alongside the operations at, at Elephant Butte is because we have a treaty relationship with Mexico since 1906 that guarantees, at least allegedly, depending on rainfall and storage, that each country gets a certain amount of water. Now, the Bolsones is a whole other black box. There are now, there's a woman um, at uh, Texas A&M, Rosario Sanchez, who has mapped for the first time what we think are 44 sub subsoil cross-border aquifers. Bear in mind that most of this is desert territory. We have no treaty relationship with Mexico to manage the use of those waters. In fact, we just learned, based on her white paper a few months ago, just where even those aquifers even were. And so, the, the subsoil dimension of that larger hydrological system that Rebecca introduced us to is incredibly important, not just in the context of bilateral relations, but in the context of desert survival in high density settlements. This is big cities in the desert for the first time in human history. And I grew up my whole life there drinking groundwater. We don't use river water to, for, for human consumption. And it's running low. It's heavily salinated. Just, uh, thank you so much for this uh, very, really brilliant um, ways to think. Um, when you were talking about the fact that we, we have to learn not to not to be human to think about geological times, for instance, to talk about the river. I was thinking, even if you want to talk about us as human or human times, we also have to have, you know, a kind of non-human approach. I was thinking of, for instance, when something like Fu Fukushima happens, you know, and that the result is going to be uh, pertained for 100,000 years, it's exactly the same thing. So this kind of symmetries goes also towards thinking the a future as well as, as the past, geological times, I think, you know. It's a kind of, 
it's a kind of symmetrical approach that you can actually have between those two, um, uh, you know, ways of analysis, ways of thinking, of ways of, you know, ways of saying, of ways of voicing things. I, I think that's exactly right. I think the question of bioaccumulation of heavy metals in particular is astonishing in its scope and, and, and requires us to think not just from a multi-species point of view, but from a, a deep future point of view. I think the question of radioactivity, like you, like you point out, is especially pertinent in this context because you have to remember the first atomic weapon in human history was detonated in the desert uh, right near their, their border in southern New Mexico, and it's still radioactive. And in fact, in the Great Basin in the United States, we detonated over 900 weapons. So we basically, during the Cold War, we, um, we nuked ourselves for, for decades and decades in a way that the Brits were able to do in Australia and the French were able to do in Algeria, other deserts, right? And so we have our own deserts to destroy with, nu with, nuclear, uh, with nuclear weaponry. And I think that that's another way that I think about not just deep history, but also deep future, and also how I think about the broad context of the militarization of the border, not just exclusively in the context of, of the securitization of migrants and black markets and that sort of thing, but also in the sense that it's a military zone for both the Mexican army and, and the U.S. army in terms of weapons testing, in terms of you know, civil patrols, so on and so forth. Thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering in how far um, a non-anthropocentric approach of uh, the Rio Grande as um, uh, really uh, the only uh, important uh, space here, not any settler colonial borders would be in line with indigenous cosmological um, understandings of Turtle Island as being united. I'm asking because um, the um, Tohono O'odham Nation of the U.S.-Mexican uh, border does actually um, massively resist the construction of a border wall, but also, in a way, um, assists um, the uh, U.S.-Mexican um, uh, poli border police, uh, border patrol, in terms of determining who is of their nation and has the right to cross this um, space as a tribal member, though of course they do not do this uh, in a way that would be comparable to some of the military violence that we have been seeing. Um, so um, once again, what is possibly the connection of um, a non-anthropocentric approach to indigenous cosmology? Yeah, I, that is such such an interesting question, and one I think about a lot. If you, you can't understand indigenous history in northern Mexico and the western United States without understanding river history, they're one and the same, precisely because it's, it's a desert, there are multiple deserts, it's dry land. And so ev every culture, the Tohono O'odham actually are kind of one of the kind of exceptions to that, because they're like true desert people. Uh, have built their settlements along rivers. But if you go to the upper part of the Rio Grande, um, what you find is the, are, are some of the, the oldest uh, continuously occupied places in North America, going back in the documented record a thousand years, which is a long time for us um, in, in North America but certainly vastly predate, uh, you know, settler colonialism in the region, both by Mexico and, and by the Americans. And, and they're still there. And um, you can see, I think that where the cosmological question becomes really interesting is when you start to find very significant tension between the the widely agreed upon scientific consensus 
about the chronology of people crossing the land bridge from Eurasia and linguistic proliferation and differentiation, and then eventually the settling of the Americas by, by human beings from the same stock as we're all from, just originating millions of years ago in, in East Africa. And in almost all indigenous cosmologies, they don't tell that story. They tell the story of we came typically from the ground, and we know where, there, is a specific site, or at least a specific zone within the homeland. And so, and there's typically not much of an interest in nailing down the chronology in the way that there is in Western epistemologies. And so, to me, there are two ways to approach this. There's the way that a lot of people have, which is to try to figure out who's right, which I think is asking the wrong question. And then I think there is the, the more challenging way, and that is to, to develop narratives that hold indigenous cosmologies in parallel, as it were, with Western cosmologies, and recognizing that the Western scientific method and our laboratory analysis and our carbon-14 dating and our dendrochronology and all the other methods that we have to determine age and meaning are also cultural systems. And from that point of view, you don't need, uh, you don't need an answer. <laughs> you just, you just, you just need, because they're both, they're both right in, in that regard. Um, we can talk more in, in detail if you want about the specific tribes, but it's a very good and complex question. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I hope we'll find time, you know, to talk about all of these things over lunch. But uh, I think this was a, a wonderful, I'm, I'm kind of like, wow, right? How this all has worked out together. Thank you very much. Lunch, exhibition, student projects, and then we're back for our second session. I hand over to my colleagues. So thank you very much. Enjoy lunch.